taxonomical hierarchy for music then, at the penultimate level, there would be two kingdoms of music, lived music and learned music. In the wider scheme of things, neither has primacy and eventually they become one another, but each serves its own purpose. Lived music is a diegetic soundtrack we encounter in the course of our lives as we live them, a song we hear on the radio or encounter over the credits of a movie, gifted to you in a mixtape from a friend or the record collection of a sophisticated older sibling, or that gets played in a club or at a party or if you see a band playing live, it becomes emblematic of and a soundtrack to specific places, memories or rituals in your life. Learned music is the music that, once our lived music has formed our tastes and curiosities, we seek out and add to our palettes. It's a hit and miss process and some of it may even reach the point of becoming part of our lived music. But the adventure of wanting, seeking and finding is one of the greatest gifts of allowing music to become a thread in our lives. As time goes by, the span of what is lived and learned music, however, becomes blurred or overlapped. Listeners of my generation generally have a more fixed distinction between lived and learned because when we first experienced music, it was generally music that belonged to that time and that society. There were very rigid structures around music and the way it was distributed and broadcast and the music that was distributed and broadcasted at any given time was what was currently popular. My daughter's generation though, because it has immediate access to any music from any time without any contemporary composed context and have a far broader range of lived music. Previously in the Righteous Boat Jambo, we have looked at the music of the 1920s, 30s, 40s and 50s as an alien music from what seemed an infinitely distant past. In the 1960s, we entered the range of music most broadly appreciated by any potential audience this off-brand microchannel may attract, but for me, this was, in the vast majority, still a learned music. Music I, and most of the viewers here I assumed, followed back to the 50s and 60s through dint of happy accidents or a peripatetic curiosity. As we confront the 1970s, however, the country shifts radically because we enter, for me, the world where lived music and all of the unfathomable value that that adds to a piece meets learned music that I visited once my desire to fully understand music more wholly, allied to a sharpening critical faculty, sent me on its mission. And that circumstance is what makes looking at the 1970s the most challenging of the tasks we've set ourselves so far in this series. As I sit writing this in August 2023, it's 10 months and five versions since I started work on it, and that time has been spent trying to work around the way in which I would present a story where previously I had sold my learned music to you, to hopefully add to your learned music, and change it to one where a group of songs so heavily coloured by my lived music would be at best an unreliable and at worst a very dull invitation to the viewer to explore new music. I say unreliable because no matter how artful I may have been in constructing the final subjects in the form of these essays, the fact that I almost entirely neglect two of the defining forms of the decade, hard rock, heavy metal, I'm sorry, especially metal, I just don't have a clue about it and didn't feel qualified to talk about it, and prog, although there are a few cases in which I was begrudgingly impressed. So they are largely left out of the discussion. It was very difficult to develop a product that could meet the challenges of being critically satisfying, entertaining for the viewer, and to present the music in its importance in its best light. The countdown method worked reasonably well for the 50s and 60s, and it was presumed that it would do so here. Yeah, no. It didn't seem valid to assign a relative worth to a list that was so uninclusive of music as explained above. Nevertheless, flawed as it may be, here over the next few weeks will be Foul Quince's hosted tour of the 1970s. By the end of 1969, most of the dominant popular music forms were in turbulent revolution or approaching the peak of their regime. Rock, after emerging five years earlier as the soundtrack to the baby boomers' ascent to some kind of intellectual maturity, was getting heavier in sound and message and was positioning itself on the edge of society and in some cases over the edge of it, embracing a collective cultural cognitive dissonance whereby it called for utopian values of community, peace and free love, yet it was prepared to resort and endorse increasingly severe acts of violence to achieve it. Jazz, largely at the hands of Miles Davis, was resolving the conflict between the newer free jazz and the musicians who progressed the form in a less radical manner, by largely bypassing it altogether with the new, more commercially aligned fusion style, which many jazz musicians immediately adopted and got rich from. Except Miles. He, if anything, went back to dissonance and disputatiousness, 
The Blues was at its commercial peak with B.B. King lodging top 40 singles in his two namesakes, Freddie and Albert, along with Buddy Guy and Albert Collins, being hot, hot currency. Then there was the wave of British blues acts, Fleetwood Mac, Eric Clapton and Jeff Beck taking the music to a wider, whiter audience. Soul music had, while retaining its gut bucket style, also split off into hard, funky music under the guidance of James Brown and his lieutenant Sly Stone and George Clinton. While there'll always be pop music, 1969 was the year Bubblegum arrived and the preteen dollar came into play. Sugar Sugar by the Archies was the biggest hit for years. Reggae escaped Jamaica, Harry J. Allstars, Desmond Decker, Dave and Ansel Collins, Bob and Marsha, the Paragons, Pioneers and the Melodians all had huge hits on the UK charts. In Germany, the early experimental and psych and space rock groups were defining the classic Kosmisch sound, or Krautrock as we might like to call it. In Australia, the local industry had a remarkable decade, with its first supergroups in the Easy Beats and the Masters Apprentices emerging, a festival scene taking off and a genuine homegrown superstar in Johnny Farnham. And as the breadth of label scouting widened, strange and compelling new sounds were coming from Africa. The only quarter of the music world in conflict seemed to be country music. While Johnny Cash was one of the biggest selling stars in the world, he stood above an industry that was determined to reposition the commercial heart of the music, from the honky tonks to the housing estate, from the boonies to the burbs, from the dawn to dusk till the nine to five. Contrapolitan, which chased the more affluent Emma Gray market, which was raised on country music and had, across the economic boom in the 50s, migrated north and west. Push as the industry did, there was a persistent holdout from the more conservative elements of the most conservative music, which led to the outlaw country music. Most encouragingly of all, superstars who drove the late 60s into legend, Jimi Hendrix, The Beatles, The Rolling Stones, The Who, Creedence Clearwater Revival, The Beach Boys, Led Zeppelin, Simon and Garfunkel, Pink Floyd, The Doors and Fleetwood Mac were all still active, vital and relevant. How could 1970 go wrong? Just as the 1960s had commenced, having seen the downfall of several of the 50s major actors in a Finder sequel, it seemed the legends of the 60s also had a difficult time outliving the times they defined. Jim Morrison of The Doors, Al Wilson of Canned Heat, Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix died of various myth adventures within 30 weeks between July and October. Of these, the death of Hendrix obviously cast the greatest pall over the upcoming decade. Genius is a term I use very sparingly indeed, and doubly so with musicians, but Hendrix was a force of nature. While you can point to any half a hundred technically better players on any given day, no one has ever had that mix of the riff, the tone, the feel, and the sense of mischief and disruption in his playing that Hendrix had. What would he have done if he'd lived? Just think for a moment that he'd already done enough to earn his legendary reputation by the time of his demise. His potential was limitless. Of the other Americans, Creedence Clearwater Revival had a mighty 1970 on the back of their classic Cosmos Factory and rather underrated Pendulum albums. But the band had been fatally fractured. A dear friend of mine who'd worked backstage at our local concert hall between 1964 and 1980 says that when Creedence came there in 1971, he had never seen four people who hated each other so much. They were gone by mid-1972. After a desultory, but not entirely, or not as bad as they say, album Mardi Gras, it has its redeeming points. The Beach Boys, whose stock took an upswing by four big hits in late 1968 through 69, were toiling manfully on two fronts, trying to develop a more legitimate profile as a band, and also to step out of Brian Wilson's increasingly widening and immobile shadow. They gave it a darn good go. All of their early 70s albums, Surf's Up, Sunflower, Carl and the Passions and Holland, are at the very least interesting, and in the case of Sunflower and Carl and the Passions, sadly underrated. But 1976's ungodly abomination, 15 big ones, sent them back to the state fair circus, despite rallying for an utterly deranged, unremittingly entertaining and understandably ignored Beach Boys Love You. That was it for America's band. Simon and Garfunkel came into the 1970s with Bridge Over Troubled Water, one of the biggest albums of all time. Ten weeks at number one in the US and 25 million sold worldwide, followed quickly by a greatest hits album containing five of the songs from the album that sold 14 million in the USA alone. The iconic title song would have been a reputation definer for 99.9% .9 of composers, but it is to Simon's credit that he had never particularly seen it as that. It's a song he wrote and now pays his rent, and that career-defining song is the next one he writes. One can only imagine his high dudgeon, though, 
that the immediate thing people notice about the record is not his supreme craft as a songwriter, but the heavenly voice of Art Garfunkel. But the relationship was never tenable. Simon's long-time grievances with his partner, life being much taller than him, finally coming to a head when Garfunkel wouldn't make himself available to record a follow-up because of commitments to a film role and a difficult new wife. The two went their separate ways, only to reunite, immediately regret reuniting, wage war in the press and then reunite again at maddenly sporadic intervals over the next 50 years. Fleetwood Mac were kings of the British blues and Peter Green was one of the most mysterious and inspired guitarists of his generation. Green had replaced Eric Clapton in John Mayall's Blues Breakers, only he himself to be replaced by future Rolling Stone, Mick Taylor, but all was not well for them as the new year turned. The fact that that is plainly evident in their darkly malevolent hit, the Green Manalishi with the two-pronged crown. It was a fateful acid trip while jamming on a commune near Munich that tripped the fragile Green into a Sid Barrett-like crepuscular decline. Fleetwood Mac would muddle along to inconsistent results for the next few years, recruiting John McVie's wife Christine, the reigning British female vocalist of the year, to join the band, before a remarkable reinvention in the mid-70s, which we'll discuss later. Fleetwood Mac, incidentally, were not named after Mick Fleetwood and John McVie. Well, not directly, because John McVie wasn't an original member of the band. The name came from an instrumental jam that Fleetwood, McVie and Green used to play together when they were in the Blues Breakers. So it's named after the song Fleetwood Mac, which is named after Fleetwood and Mac, not Fleetwood and Mac directly. That'll win your money in a pub one day. Pink Floyd were also a slightly perilous proposition coming into 1970. Having finally divested themselves of ace bonkers dude Sid Barrett, they made two albums for 1969, the almost pointless Amagama and the mediocre soundtrack to the movie More. But this was put to right later in 1970 when they released the excellent Adam Hard Mother, which defined the essential terms of engagement for Pink Floyd albums hereafter, and they went from strength to strength thereon. Up to 1967, The Who were the cleverest, most consistent and most provocative providers of 45s to the UK charts, until Tommy embedded them in the underground and Townsend's thoughts turned to altogether loftier matters. They roared, often literally, into the 1970s with a triple punch of great albums. Live at Leeds in 1970, Who's Next in 1971, and the impeccable Quadrophenia in 1973. Led Zeppelin were looming as huge at the turn of the decade and they fulfilled that promise in spectacular style as they crossed into the new era an earth-shaking behemoth, one part Adonis, one part cadaverous vampire, one part Hephaestus and one part geography teacher. The Rolling Stones approached the 70s embroiled in controversy but audacious in their ambition. Fresh from divesting themselves of founder member come Millstone around their necks, Brian Jones, hiring hot young gun Mick Taylor to do the heavy guitar lifting, and undertaking a legendary and infamous tour of the USA in 1969, culminating in the ultimate buzzkill, the murderous ultimate concert, CTRB 88 for more details. On the back of two great to exceptional albums that rounded out the decade in Beggar's Banquet and Let It Bleed, they made their way across the divide with the live album Get Your Yass Yass Out, and then started to define the state of rock music in the new decade with Sticky Fingers in 1971 and Exile on Main Street in 1972. There is spirited debate amongst fans as to which is the superior pound for pound. Exile seems to be the current favourite, but personally I've always favoured the less decadent, scungier Sticky Fingers. It's more desperate, more about the destination at the end of the highway to hell than the straight and narrow way, and every song on the album has a killer melody. Exile on Main Street has some spectacular moments, but there's a lot of stuff on there which is obscure and effusive, but not deep. The critical moment in 1970 for the Stones was the severance of their contract with Alan Klein's organisation and the setting up in July 1970 of Rolling Stones Records, distributed through Atlantic, making them the first major act to be able to completely control not only the artistic aspects of their career, but the financial as well. The Beatles definers of so much of music's cultural value in the 1960s did not have, it must be said, such a great year in 1970. However, as the new year turned, Abbey Road was at number one in the US, having ended the charts on October 18 and making number one in the first week of November, where it was to stay for 11 weeks until January the 24th. But that triumph hit a bitter and fatally fractured band. How the Beatles might possibly have made possibly the most famous album cover ever and maybe perhaps managed to kind of break up on the same day, maybe. <laughs> 
Who knows, contains a lot of made up stuff. Well lads, that road's not gonna cross itself. Right you are Johnny, let's get to it. If it gets us out of another 30 takes of Maxwell's silver hammer, count me in. That's bloody disgusting Ringo. Sorry Paul. It's probably why your nose is so big. Do we have to walk all that way? What's the problem Paul? I'm not wearing any shoes. Stop mucking about, you daft buggers. Sorry, John. Well, I'm not. I'm just having fun. I'm a cheeky scouser on a spree is what I am. I just wish you could take this more seriously, like George does. Don't bring me into this. John, you're not doing the walk, John. This happens when you miss rehearsals. He couldn't come. He was stuffed in a bag with what's-her-face. Sorry, boys. Didn't get it. Let's go again. My feet hurt. If Mr. Epstein were here, he'd have made sure you had shoes. Hey, Johnny, she's a smashing bird, that Yoko is. F*** off, Ringo. The breakup of the Beatles is the subject for another story, but suffice to say, the band that bestrode the previous era of music like a colossus was privately over for a month before Abbey Road came out, legally over by April the 10th, which was my birthday, and legally by May the 8th, the day that let it be, a downbeaten, disputatious final blow was released. John Lennon, in his gratuitous and bloody-minded interviews with Jan Wenner, conducted at the end of 1970, said the fans should be happy the Beatles broke up because it meant that the four were no longer competing for space on one album for their songs, so there was, by extension, four times as much great music. Was there? Let's use the rest of our time this week to look at the legacy of the four solo Beatles in the 1970s. Ringo. Ringo released Sentimental Journey and Buku of Blues in 1970, but neither was critically acclaimed. Ringo, 1973, featured collaborations with other Beatles and received huge praise for its catchy tunes and commercial good sense. Goodnight Vienna was similarly received, but marked a commercial peak. Ringo's Rutte Gravure, 1976, and Ringo the Fourth the next year, faced lukewarm reviews, although some tracks did garner a little attention. Ringo did particularly well on my local charts with three number one singles, Back Off Boogaloo and Don't Come Easy and Photograph, and every one of his albums, no matter how ignored it was in the rest of the world, made our local charts. George Harrison. George Harrison's All Things Must Pass marked a seemingly triumphant start to his solo career, although it could be accused of being similar to Exile on Main Street in having too few truly strong tunes against too many long, preachy, whiny workouts. It is, however, still the biggest selling Beatles solo album. Living in the Material World from 1973 continued in a similar sour, dour vein. Dark Horse from 1974 was widely criticised for its rush production. Extra Texture from 1975 struggled critically from its lack of variety and original sounds. 33 and a third marked a slight return to form, largely due to its sunny era. John Lennon's solo career began in 1970 with the release of John Lennon Plastic Ono Band, an emotionally raw album that received critical acclaim for its honesty and vulnerability. Imagine from 1971 continued his success, featuring the to some iconic, until you listen to what it's actually saying, title track, and plenty of good cuts as well. It sounded like a pretty fairly rounded view of Lennon at the time. Mind Games, though, in 1973 was a competent sounding record, with 1972's Sometime in New York City was a disaster by dabbling in radical politics and soundscaping. Mind Games in 1973 was a rebound, a competent sounding record with very little either exceptional or objectionable on it, while Walls and Bridges from 1974 was a real curate's egg. Some of it was tremendous, some of it was tedious. Rock and Roll in 1975 was perhaps the ultimate contractual obligation album, but Lennon seems to wade into it pretty well. Some of it is great. Some of it, Sweet Little Sixteen, Do You Want to Dance, is way off. With the dissolution of Apple, Lennon slid into a domestic idyll for five years, combining fatherhood, Holstein cows, and the odd bout of the old heroine. He attempted a comeback in 1980 with a new album. It didn't end well. Paul McCartney's solo career in the 70s was deeply frustrating and too often indulged his vices rather than highlighted his strengths, and ultimately he reached the point where he was having hits with songs that any other artist would have been laughed at for. Daytime, Nighttime Suffering, Good Night Tonight, Wonderful Christmas Time, purely on his Beatle Paul rep. Macca kicked off with McCartney in 1970, a seeming act of musical hubris. There were a couple of good songs, somewhat more dull and pointless ones, and a lot of useless noodlings. Received mixed reviews and made number one for three weeks in the United States. 
Ram from the next year was more warmly received for its melodic charm and whimsy, but you got the feeling there were no really substantial tunes there. Wildlife was pointless, and Red Row Speedway was lazy and guileless, although he did snap out of it very quickly afterwards, providing the slamming theme to the James Bond film Live and Let Die, only a couple of months later. Band on the Run from 1973, which contained his first undisputed classic, a song that would have held its own on any Beatles album in Jet, and Venus and Mars in 1975 were his critical high water, that including the excellent 1974 single Junior's Farm. This was due largely to Macca re-emphasising his bass playing and giving the two records, especially Venus and Mars, real punch. Wings at the Speed of Sound, Silly Love Songs Aside, was largely a throwaway, but London Town and Back to the Egg showed a man desperately short of ideas and desperately unwilling to change. So began the 1970s and so ended the 60s. In our future episodes, we'll start to look at the genres that defined the 70s as unique and the people whose achievements furthered the cause of the classic canon in the 1970s. I look forward to your company on those occasions.